All right, Jim, take us back in time. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all the above? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I was kind of a a music guy from the age I was four because mm. um, my sisters, they played ukulele and we used to, with my parents go down to Florida every year to visit my relatives and they had the ukuleles. I had my little, ukule- well, they were all little guitars. <laughs> I had a ukulele and my sisters taught me how to play, you know, da-da, 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 da-da. you know, really simple songs, you know. So that was really my start in music, the the great memories of my two older sisters and me. I was four and they were like, you know, 10 and 12, you know, and they taught me all the chords, all four chords, you know, all the ones you need to know. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and those were were great times going down to my Uncle Raymond's uh, place. Uh, He had a soft ice cream uh, stand uh, in in, uh, Miami and we used to he used to let me spoon on the uh, the pine crushed pineapple onto the the Sundays, and that that was heaven. So all those great memories conflated into a thing called music, you know. <laughs> Did you grow up in Miami? Was that where you would say you had your roots? Uh, no, always always Berwyn, Illinois. But we always traveled down to Florida in our '52 Chrysler New Yorker, mm. and um, and visited my relatives. Mm. But yeah. All the Ides of March grew up in Berlin, Illinois. Uh, in fact, Larry, who you just met briefly, um, still lives in that same house. That, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that the Ides of March used to um, rehearse in ever since the beginning of the Ides of March in 1964. Mm. So, uh, Jim, were either your parents, were they musical at all? My dad, very musical, uh, you know, because he grew up in, in the Depression. Uh, you know, he worked automatic electric adjusting relays at, at the phone company. But on weekends, he had a band, uh, I guess you'd call it a polka band, but they did standards and, you know, like the top 40 of that day. Uh, they were called the high hatters And in the basement, there are the stands with the high hatters and the, the, the hat, you know, and I used to look down there. And when I was old enough, you know, I was, my first instrument was actually piano, but then I switched to saxophone. And when I was like 10 years old, I would sneak over and sit on the bandstand, stand on the bandstand in back of the guys and play sax with the, with the hi-hatters. And <laughs> those were great times. That's awesome. So your first instrument was, I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, piano was piano. first. Piano was uh, first. You know, I learned enough to know that I knew enough. You know, mm. Mr. Ulrich was boring. And um, so no offense, Mr. <laughs> Ulrich, but... Uh, I learned enough to, you know, fiddle around to what I call a songwriter's piano, which always served me well. Yeah. But then I, I really, you know, the Ides of March were a band now, and we saw like the Ventures, you know, on TV playing Walk, Don't Run. And that was before the Beatles, right? And like, you know, 63. Right. Uh, before we, there was any, you know, influx of the a, a Liverpool thing. We were big Ventures fans that we did, you know, like Walk, Don't Run. You know, and just love that stuff. And it was like surf music, really. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, the Beatles came along and uh, we saw them first on a, like a special, like a BB, BBC grainy foot, footage uh, on the Jack Parr show. And then, uh, you know, I go to the music store and said, God, there's this band that's coming, uh, Mrs. Balkan. <laughs> They're called the Beatles. And she's just laughing, the Beatles, forget about it. You know, I said, okay, just wait. About a month later, they're on uh, on uh, Ed Sullivan, and the country is going crazy. Mm. I go back to the Balkans music store, and I said, see? <laughs> Told you. You were, you were right. <laughs> So, uh, Jim, when you think about doing formative films and TV shows that you grew up on, what comes into your head? Shindig, uh, Hullabaloo, uh, The Ed Sullivan Show, uh, Jack Parr, because he had musical guests, Steve Allen. I mean, we go way back. Like, I was born in 50, so 
the fifties were a great time. I remember uh, Elvis Presley uh, televised from the waist down because they didn't want those suggestive hips swinging in our young teenagers uh, faces, you know, and uh, he's doing hound dog and don't be cruel. And I was going crazy. I was six <laughs> years old and uh, he was just Mr. Cool, you know? Yeah. So uh, did you ever have to deal with stage fright? And if you did, how'd you overcome it? Hmm. Actually, stage fright was never a part of, of my life. I was born a ham. Um, I, I was <laughs> like thrust into the spotlight, you know, because my sisters thought I was a star. They didn't know any better. And uh, so I, I was very, very comfortable in the spotlight, very comfortable on stage. Never any stage fright. Like, let me at it. That was kind of my attitude. Gotcha. So what about your very first time on stage, whatever you consider that to be, whether it was with the church band or school yeah. or whatever? <laughs> well, yeah, it was the Ides. Well, it's before the, we were called the Ides of March. We were called the Shondells. We eventually had to change our name because Tommy James and the Shondells came along with Hanky Panky and we go, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and we're all in high school reading Julius Caesar and uh, Bob Bergman, our bass player, to this day, our bass player. Uh, original four guys still together after 60 years next year. Wow. Um, said, you know, I'm reading Julius Caesar right now, and there's this great phrase, beware the Ides of March. And we look at each other and go, that's our new name, the Ides of March. It's way better than the Shondells anyway. It's a cool name. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> so would you say around what age were you when you began to take you know, music seriously, and you think, you know what, I can make a career out of this thing. Well, you know, we never thought in terms of career. Mm. We just thought of in terms of having a great time. It's like the greatest club you could belong to is called the Ides of March. Uh, we would get together in Larry's basement and rehearse and learn the top 40. But then we would sneak in originals that I would write or co write with the band. And, uh, you know, in 66, uh, I wrote kind of a catchy song that I showed the guys, and it started like this. And Larry would say, I told you he was a fool. You wouldn't listen to me. You break your heart. You wouldn't listen to me. And we were channeling everything we were hearing on the radio, the Hollies and the Bo Brummels and we kind of flitted it all into a hit called You Wouldn't Listen and went to 42 nationally, number one in Chicago for five weeks. And suddenly we're on the road with the Allman Brothers, who at that time were called the Allman Joys, and uh, <laughs> just have, having a blast. And we, you know, we took the train down to Florida and uh, we got off the train and all of our mic stands were sheared off at the base. And we learned a lesson about traveling with equipment on a train mm, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so correct me if i'm wrong jim but you know at one point I th you were uh you were selling uh, and writing jingles for commercials right i was mainly singing them okay. uh um i uh you know the writing part usually i would i would um, show up uh to one of the jingle houses i call them the three dicks Dick Boyle, Dick Marks, and and Dick Dick Boyle, Dick Marks, and Dick Reynolds, the three dicks, and they were all great guys. They weren't dicks, really. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, the Ides had just had the hit vehicle, and I was on the front. You know, I, I call it the beer and tires voice, and that's what I became. <laughs> I'm the friend of stranger in the black sedan. Won't you hop inside my car? I got pictures. Kenny, I'm a lovable man. Take it to the new star. I'm your vehicle, baby. I'll take you anywhere you want to go. I'm your vehicle, woman. But now I'm sure you know that I love you. I need you. I want you. Got to have your child. Great God in heaven, you know I love, I love you. Ba -da -ba -ba -da. No. <laughs> so I was the, suddenly the beer and tires voice and the three dicks would be calling me to do all these jingles, which was extremely lu lucrative. 
Yeah. Um, you know, because I was trying to finance the next demo tape for the Ides of March or, you know, finance whatever. And uh, jingles were great. And, you know, and I, and I had things like, now that you've had a drink, oh, what a time to think. I should have had a V8 and on and on and on. <laughs> And those were actually kind of fun times because in the same room, there was all these great singers from the Chicago scene, the jingle singers like Bonnie Herman and Bob Bowker. But then there was this other guy. He always came uh, wearing a beret and he sat in the, when he wasn't singing to the side, he was re reading sci-fi books. And I got to meet him. His name was Dave Bickler. Mm. And uh, fast forward to a few years later, when I was putting together the group Survivor, and he was the first guy I called to sing. And uh, Dave Bickler joined what became Survivor, was called the Jim Peterick Band. But it was myself, Dave Bickler, Frankie Sullivan, and, uh, and Gary Smith and Des Johnson. Uh, and we became Survivor. So, Jim, was it you created Survivor? Uh, you were going on hiatus with the Eyes of March, right? Yeah, in in 73, uh, we did our last concert. It wasn't really our last concert, but for 17 years, it was our last concert because, well, you know, for one thing, I wanted to try different avenues and, uh, you know, everybody had like a different career path. And um, we didn't get a lot of encouragement just to keep going. And sometimes I wish we had, but, you know, mm. history takes its course. And it is what it is, and um, it happened the way it was supposed to happen. Right. And uh, while we're talking about Survivor for a second, I just wanted to ask you, what were those initial conversations like with Sly Stallone about the Rocky <laughs> soundtrack? Uh, right. Well, you know, that's a very funny story because it started with a message on my answer machine. You know, that was in the days when there was a cassette running, you know, it wasn't digital at all, you know, and I, I got home one day and I was sorting the mail, you know, and I hear a message from my sister and another one from my friend Steve. And then I then I hear, hey, yo, Jim, it's a nice answering machine you got there. Give me a call. It's Sylvester Stallone. I click and I keep sorting mail, you know, think, thinking it's such a joke. You know? yeah. <laughs> and my wife, God bless her, um, she overheard that and said, was that? And I said, uh, some joker pretending to be Stallone, you know. And she said something loving like, you idiot. <laughs> you better call them back. They're just on the off chance. So uh, I called that 213 area code, you know, good sign. And, uh, and I hear he answers, yo, this is a good sign. <laughs> so I said, this is Jim Peter, because this really Sylvester Stallone. He goes, hey, Jimbo, call me Sly. You know, <laughs> here Who I am. Cucumber? <laughs> yeah. So here I am. I, I sober up real quickly. And I said, nice talking to Sly. What's going on? And he says, well, I'm a big fan of Survivor. I love that one song, Poor Man's Son, that you guys did, Tony Scotty head of the label played it for me. He said, that's the sound I want for my new movie, Rocky three. And uh, I said, well, what about going to fly now? You know? Oh yeah, that, 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 that's nice. You know, that's old school. I need something new, something fresh, something for the kids. Can you help me out? I said, hey, you're damn right. <laughs> <laughs> and he sends us the rough cut of the movie. And I got together with Frankie and, and we see, uh, you know, Mr. T looking fierce with his mohawk rising up you know and just looking very very uh threatening and you see stallone kind of getting soft doing master charge commercials you know and i had my guitar around my neck and i just was trying to catch the pulse and i just started going like that you know and i'm trying to catch the chords with the punches you know so it just kind of became
So before you know it, we had this song. And uh, we didn't have all the words or whatever yet. But as I was jogging around the neighborhood, because, you know, I, I, I love to run and jog. And I had my little tape recorder with me. And, you know, and Frankie had given me a couple seed lines. He said, uh, back on the street, doing time, uh, taking chances. I, I said, I really like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm running, I'm, I'm rising up back on the street, did my time, took my chances, went the distance. Now I'm back on my feet, just a man and its will to survive. Hell yeah. <laughs> and uh, we go into CRC, Chicago Recording Company, about four days later, called the band together, in, and we cut that thing in like three takes, you know. Wow. And mixed it and sent it to Stallone and... He flipped out. And, you know, what a lot of people don't know is that demo version, because the deadline was so tight to get into the movie, it's the demo that's used in the movie, Rocky Three. Holy shit. Yeah, and we recorded <laughs> like four days, you know. Uh, but it, when you catch lightning in a bottle, you know, it's really hard to re recreate that. We had to re-record it for our label because the, the movie company was a different label. So... What took us like five days, six days to complete the first one, it took us like a month and a half for the final version, the one that you hear on the radio. Mm. And um, it just goes to show you when you catch lightning in a bottle, you can't just catch it twice. You have to work harder to achieve that innocence of the first one. Right. And like you said, catching that lightning in a bottle, when you catch that lightning, there's got to be some indication you guys have as musicians. You've been doing this for a while, and you're like, oh, oh, your toes are tapping or you got something going. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Goosebumps is another good one, you know. Mm. And Dave Bickler, just um, unbelievable vocal on that. You know, that really defined his voice and his persona. It's all there in his vocal. Mm, yeah. And uh so when you're dealing with writing a song for a major film like that, uh, how many channels do you have to go through for approval? Was it just, you know, they just gave you guys free reign and you got the thumbs up? Well, thank God we had a boss named Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. <laughs> and pretty much what he said goes, you know, hmm. at the time. And he had the power to say, no, this is the song, you know, yeah. you don't understand. This is going to be huge, you know. So, uh um, there was really no arguments there. Awesome. You know, so, so with the success of Eye of the Tiger, it was probably a no brainer to bring you guys back, you know, for the, the burning heart. <laughs> right. Uh, we were on the road with REO and uh, we got the second call. Well, more than the second, but second major call from Stallone and Frankie and I are around the pool. You know, we're, we had this tour with REO, which is amazing. And we get another call from Stallone. Well, you guys did it once. You got to do it twice. Um, what do you mean? Well, Rocky Four, you know. And uh, I, we said no problem. And he sent us the script. This time we we didn't work from the movie. The first time we had a rough cut of the, of the movie. This time we're just working with the script. But it was enough. And I remember. We had our, our road crew put the Wurlitzer in one of the hotel rooms down a couple of days later. And Frankie and I just worked at that piano um, on this thing. It originally was going to be called The Unmistakable Fire. Uh, and in the first line, instead of In the Burning Heart, it, it was In the Human Heart, just about to burst. Uh, and, and then the, the big tagline on the chorus was, the unmistakable fire. Okay, good. So we met with Stallone. He says, well, you know, that's nice, you know, but unmistakable fire. I mean, you can use that, but we need a bigger hook at the top, you know. And I don't know exactly who brought up this. It might have been Frankie or it could have been Stallone, but someone said, it wasn't me, in the burning heart. And I said, isn't that a song already by uh, Vandenberg? And, and Frank goes, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so it became Burning Heart, and um, I'm glad it did. Yeah, it, another huge song. Uh, uh, you've written a number of songs for a number of bands, Jim. You know, Survivor, Ides of March. 
38 special Sammy Hagar goes on. So what's the secret sauce in your opinion? You got to know something. <laughs> yeah. Secret sauce. That's a good term. Um, you know, it's really relatability. I think, uh, kind of trying to strike some kind of universal chord, uh, in a song lyrically. I mean, sure. You need the hook, you need the melody, all that, but you also need something relatable, um, that people go, yeah, uh, I've lived that, you know, um, I'm your vehicle, baby. I'll take you anywhere you want to go. What guy has not been a slave to the girl he loves right. and, and doesn't care what, man, I will take you anywhere you want to go. Great God in heaven, you know, you know, it's just like the universal theme is still love. And uh, my songs tend to be very positive. I don't think there's a lot of doom and gloom in my songs. And I think that if there's any heartbreak towards the end, there's a ray of hope. And that's what I like to project. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing songs for other bands, do they, uh, so 38 special specifically, do they reach out to you and or do they buy a song that you had already written or something like that? Well, a, a little of both. Um, I had, what I had, I would had, had a guardian angel and he's still alive. His name is John Kaladner. And he's the guy with the long beard. He was in the pump video with Aerosmith in the wedding dress. That was just a character he played. He was just this really eccentric Jewish guy that signed Survivor to our Scotty Brothers deal. And he used to put me together with people because he knew I was a good co-writer. And he's the guy that played Cupid with Henry Paul and Sammy Hagar and um, 38 Special. And I'm glad to thank John Kaladner for it. I got to tell you. Gotcha. I gotcha. So, uh, you know, out of all the projects you've worked on musically, which would you consider the most most challenging and it was the one that you lost more sleep over than the others i lost sleep out of all of them you <laughs> know because i'm totally you know tweaking the lyric and rewriting i have you know reams of crumpled up paper and every song still to this day that it's not good enough you know and uh, you just try to um, and keep raising the par mm. uh, until you there's a thing called goosebump factor. And uh, if I play a song for someone and they get a goosebump, I go, it's a hit, you know, <laughs> or at least it has a good chance. But, you know, I, I remember singing it to, to Larry's, uh, well, ex-wife uh, many years ago. And I, I, I played her a song. She says, that's a hit. Uh, and it was, I think it was like one of the Ides of March hits. And I don't remember which one. But there's a there's an innate thing that rings a bell when you when you hear a hook that is magic. Mm, mm. So you know you got Survivor going on throughout most of the eighties. When do you when do you uh, shift your attention back to the Ides of March and you guys get rolling again? Yeah, good question. Well, uh, in ninety six, I, I was on the road with, with Survivor, and I we'd come home for a break, and I just couldn't take it anymore. Mm. There was, uh, you know, friction among the band members, you know, without going into much detail. It just wasn't fun anymore. Gotcha. So I was supposed to get on a plane to go to um, Memphis, I believe. And uh, Frankie called, where are you? You're not at the airport. He said, I said, I'm not getting on. Oh, no, no, come on. I mean, you know, forget it. That All those arguments, forget it. Just, no, I said, that's it. That's it. It's the last gig. And uh, they played the show anyway, and it was with 38 Special. They played it as a, a, a trio with uh, the drummer they were using at the time, Dave Bickler and Frankie, just the three of them. And, um, you know, I, I never looked back because uh, mm. I knew there was other chapters ahead, uh, and it wasn't fun, and there was a, a lot of um, bad feelings, infighting, and it just wasn't fun anymore. Right. I can, I could imagine that. Uh, so when it comes to, you know, live shows that you've seen as a fan, what are some ones that stand out as some of the best and shows you participated in? Are there any that you, that stand out to you as mind blowing looking back? Oh my God. Well, you know, I, I go way back, you know, to consciously Joni Mitchell, you know, who's one of my songwriting heroes. 
And, um, you know, I still a huge fan. I, I'm uh, best friends with Kathy Richardson, uh, the singer of Jefferson Starship. But I remember seeing Starship way back in, in the Grace Slick days. And uh, they were just incredible. It's those early times. Janis Joplin, the Ides of March, where we played these giant pop festivals in 70 after Vehicle was a hit. And, uh, and I remember we opened for Janis Joplin. And uh, we just and led, uh, led Zeppelin. We, oh, they were for, no, no, that was another show. <laughs> but we, we toured with everyone in 70, 71, when, when Vehicle was number one in riding the charts. And uh, I remember after the, the Janis Joplin show, uh, they were great, but she was swigging from that Jack Daniels the whole time uh, on stage. Uh, and she was kind of stumbling around backstage. Well, I knew she was staying uh, at the same hotel we were, and she's like, where am I? And, oh, you know, where's my hotel? And in those days, she didn't have minders, and it wasn't professional. Right. And I said, look, I know you're staying at the hotel I'm at and the Ides are at. And I said, just take my arm. And she took my arm, and, and I led her back to the hotel, kissed her on the cheek, and said goodnight. <laughs> it was such a sweet story, and she was so lost and so drunk, and uh, just a super talent, and a gone too soon. Yeah. So all you gentlemen in the Ides of March, you guys, do you plan on touring further or releasing, working on any new stuff? Well, we've never stopped touring, you know, ever since we got back together. Actually, it was in around 92, uh, because I took a hiatus uh, uh, from Survivor for a while, and we started playing again. But when I I left Survivor, then we really put our foot down in 96, in 96, and started touring again and writing new material. And since 96, we probably have five, maybe six, seven new albums. always fresh new material uh we're um we just did another song for a thing that i call jim peterkin world stage roots and shoots which uh drops as the kids say uh january 12th on frontiers roots being the the groups that i really came up with like the ads of march like um ario speedwagon uh, don barn 38 special uh Kevin Croton I said REO those are the roots and the shoots are the young talent that I've discovered through a you know various people and talent scouts uh that I've been developing so roots and shoots volume one uh comes out on frontiers January 12th awesome oh well uh Jim I just got a few more here for you and then I'll let you go for the afternoon what is uh what would you say is the best musical advice you've received in your career and who gave it to you well <laughs> the eyes of march opened for neil diamond <laughs> larry's laughing because he knows what's coming <laughs> he had just had solitary man he was fresh in his 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 career you know this trajectory that we knew that was was going to go big and we opened for for neil diamond at a, at a a really great little high school auditorium and um we played and peterick me being kind of uh the guy oh i, I said to the band we got a few good ones but we got to learn all new stuff you know <laughs> and okay so you know we had a hit by that time called you wouldn't listen but we learned all these new songs and we went out there and we thought we were doing great we went back for an encore that was we nobody asked for. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> but we went out there, you know, and I was so self-deluded because, you know, the lights and the, you know, and so we're, we're backstage and I go up to Neil Diamond. I said, well, how, how did you like it, Neil? And he goes, hmm, well, Jim, next time, only do your best material. <laughs> Got it. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's great advice. I Neil, and he was right. And I <laughs> learned so much. I learned so much that night. Just uh, stick to what you know.
<laughs> Great. So this is something I like to ask everyone just because you never know someone's background. Uh, have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Hmm. Well, I, I have, uh, but I was like three years old and, you know, um, I had this reoccurring feeling that I was falling through space. Maybe I was two years old, but I had this reoccurring falling feeling and I would wake up and it would scare me, but it, it you know, it also interested me. What is this? Mm. And it was years later that I figured maybe I was thinking of another life or my life in the womb. Um, but I never experienced anything since then. I'll never forget those falling feelings of another place. Wow. Well, would you consider, do you consider yourself religious or spiritual, anything like that? Definitely spiritual. Um, I was raised Catholic and, um, as I like to call it, I'm a recovering Catholic, <laughs> but, um, but I do have a deep belief in something bigger than us all. Mm. And I pray uh, and I ask for assistance. I ask for guidance. Uh, I ask for inspiration mm. and, um, and solace. And I always give thanks to the, the people that paved the way for me, my mother and my father and my sister who, who passed away some years ago and my, my current sister who's still alive and pretty much fighting for her life. And of course, I always thank the Ides of March for being the family that we have been for almost 60 years now, the original four guys, Larry Millis, Jim Peterick, Mike Borch, and Bob Berglund, and Scott Mays, the newbie, he's been with us for 33 years on keyboards. So, uh, and you've talked to Scott, so yeah. uh, it's a great team, and I'm, I'm very lucky and thankful. Well said, Jim. Well, just to put a bow on everything here, why don't you just tell folks what's on the horizon for you? Is there anything you can share without getting in trouble? Ah. <laughs> Well, um, like I said, Jim Pugin World Stage Roots and Shoots in January, and then Volume 2, uh, five months later, with more collaborations and all new material from classic artists paired with new discoveries that I've come across and uh, have been inspired by, and I try to inspire back. Awesome. Well, Jim, thank you again, man. It's been a pleasure to get to chat with you for a little bit here. You too, Justin, and keep rocking, keep doing what you're doing.